It's awesome to be here. Thanks for coming out this morning. I know uh, there was some partying last night, so uh, it's always a tough, tough day to make it out on the second day. Um, I'm always curious, uh, and uh, Velocity caters to two big populations, web performance people and then operations people. How many of you would consider yourselves primarily operations focused here? Okay, pretty good. And how many of you would consider yourselves primarily web performance focused? Interesting, cool, pretty good split. Well, I've been asked here to talk to you a little bit today about velocity culture. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on a little bit more of the ops side and what I think is an unmet challenge in web ops. Uh, my argument today is gonna to proceed in kind of three parts. First, uh, I think that the success of the velocity culture overall depends on tying it to the business and real business metrics that matter. Secondly, I'm gonna argue that web performance has really succeeded in doing this incredibly well over the last several years in that there's actually an unmet challenge in ops uh, to, to sort of meet the business focus uh, and connect the dots for people. Uh, as most of you know, Velocity started in 2007 at a meeting at OzCon between Steve, Tim, uh, and a couple other people as well. Uh, the first conference was in 2008, and since that day, uh, it's grown remarkably. Um, obviously, we have more people here than we've ever had before focused on performance and ops. Um, a lot of the reason, though, that the web performance area in, in uh, Velocity has taken off so much is due to Steve, and, and Steve deserves a lot of credit. Uh, he's written several books on the subject of web performance, and he's spoken tirelessly on the topic. But perhaps even more important than Steve, and sorry, Steve, you're not, you know, the most important part possibly, is that the case studies that have come out connecting value in the business to web performance have been amazing over the years. In 2009, the Google Bing case study was, was just unbelievable, where uh, Eric Sherman and Jake talked about how Bing and Google had, had really increased the revenue for, for their companies through improving performance. 2010, we followed up with Shopzilla. They talked about it. And I was following Steve's Twitter feed just the other day when he was uh, pointing out that MSN and DoubleClick have also released some amazing numbers this year about how web performance drives real revenue for businesses. But, uh, and, and you can see that in the ecosystem of people here, right? There's tons of vendors now that are focused on web performance. But what about operations? Is operation as in, in, intimately tied to the business as web performance, or isn't it, or, or do we just not know? Um, one thing I think you'll notice looking at the Velocity Conference over the last couple of years, we haven't had a lot of case studies about how ops drives specific business metrics like we have with website performance. And I think that's an important gap that we need to fill. Because in my mind, operations is the business. They're so intimately tied together that there should be great case studies there if we could just go dig them up and start talking about them. And so that's what I'm gonna do today. Um, you'll note one thing in my case studies. One thing we're challenging ourselves to do at Amazon is to really think about how to use utility computing. Some people call it the cloud. I like utility computing to drive the way we think about change in terms of the ops space. And specifically, the question we've been asking ourselves is what if the size of your server fleet was completely flexible, right? Like most of us work at companies where our server fleets steadily increase in size, right? I'm sure Facebook's not, not reducing the size of their server fleet over time, nor is Amazon in general. But what happens if you could do that? How would your world be different? And so I'm gonna walk through two case studies where we're asking ourselves this question and we're seeing some pretty interesting results. The first case study I call scaling down. Uh, this is a graph of traffic to the Amazon.com website over a typical week. Uh, as you would expect, uh, there are peaks of traffic during the middle of the day, U.S. time, and there are troughs in the evenings. Um, and if any sort of application should be able to benefit from flexible capacity, you would think it would be something like this, right? We have divergence in our traffic pattern, and it's fairly predictable. Um, I spent several years of my life trying to predict this line on the graph. This is the expected peak plus 15%. Uh, why 15%? Well, we just figured over time that that would soak up most of the traffic spikes. But there's a problem, right? There's a big space between that red line and that blue line. And that represents waste. It's server capacity I've purchased, but that I'm not making use of. And you can calculate the areas of the graph. And if you do that for Amazon, you would find during the typical week, we would be wasting approximately 40% of the server capacity that we had purchased. Uh, that's not particularly consistent with lowering prices to customers, right? And that's very core value to us, so we want to focus on reducing that level of waste. But really, the problem's way worse than that. This is a graph of traffic to the Amazon.com website in November. 
Um, and you can see that throughout the course of the month of November, uh, the usage of the uh, Amazon.com website goes up dramatically. It more than triples between the first day of the month and the last day of the month. Uh, and in order to, to cope with that, we obviously have to buy servers. And if we do that using the same methodology, you would find out that during the month of November, with traditional capacity, Amazon would be wasting about three quarters of the servers that we bought. And we buy a lot of servers, right? We're talking tens of millions of dollars here. Wasting 75% of it is a huge cost to the business. So the problem really stems from, uh, but, but honestly, the problem's even worse than this, to be honest with you, because I have to buy those servers way in advance, right? To rack that many servers takes a long time. And so I have to buy them before November 1st, and then I'm left with them after the holiday season, right? So now I've got a ton of servers sitting around that I don't need for a long time again. And so the problem really becomes, uh, comes from this sort of philosophy in ops. Typically, we focus on what I call capacity planning, right? We focus on drawing that red line. And when you focus on drawing the red line, you're focusing on spending money, right? You go to your CFO, you say, I need to spend up to this line. A better way to think about this problem is what I would call capacity optimization, which is really trying to make that red line sort of fit the blue line all the time. And here I've represented it with a purple line. And capacity optimization is about saving money. And in the case of November, it's about saving 75% of the money. And so, so here we go. Obviously, the hardware is underutilized. We have some problems there. The second thing is traffic spikes are incredibly difficult to deal with, right? If you have an emergent load that comes on and your 15% extra isn't enough to cover it, well, I'm sure some of you have found yourselves in this situation. You're beg borrowing and stealing servers from some other area of the business to cope with that load. And the final problem is that scaling is nonlinear. Um, it turns out at Amazon, I didn't buy one server or two servers. I bought racks at a time. And because I had an availability model, I was actually buying multiple racks across multiple data centers at a time. So when I needed one more server, I might actually be buying three racks of 40, even though I only needed one more at the time. And at some point, you put the last rack in that data center that you can fit in there. And now your next single machine costs you $10 million because you have to buy a new data center. Right? That's obviously not a good model to be in. So we started looking at this problem, especially in light of utility computing, and this is a date that I'm super proud of, and we've never announced this outside of an, an Amazon-only conference before. November 10th, 2010, is the day that we turned off the last physical web server at Amazon.com. Since that day, every single hit to Amazon.com has been served from EC2. We don't own a single physical web server for Amazon.com anymore. Um, and so now we're able to completely scale traffic up or down, in increments of as small as a single server uh, as demand requires. This dramatically reduces our needs to spend on server capacity, and the fleet scales dynamically is in, in these tiny increments. We get more traffic, we just allocate more EC2 hosts. Pretty easy, uh, couldn't be nicer. But I think the really interesting part about it is the cultural change that's come from it, right? We like to come to these conferences and say, well, how big is your server fleet? Oh my God, you run tens of thousands of servers. That must be amazing. At Amazon, We've sort of changed that dynamic. And the sort of rock stars of ops now are the people who figure out how to make fleets small, not the people who figure out how to make fleets big. And that's a really powerful cultural change, I think, in, in terms of the way we look at the business. Second quick case study uh, I'll call scaling up. Uh, this is sort of a separate example. Uh, continuous deployment, it's all the rage. Everyone does it. Um, we all like to write in blogs about it. And Amazon does it, too. Uh, I wish I could stand here and tell you exactly the business value Amazon has gotten from continuous deployment. I don't have a business metric for it, um, and I haven't really seen any other specific metrics from it, but I'll take on faith that faster is better. Um, but the deployment process itself is very important to us, and we think very carefully about it. Um, there's a system internally at Amazon called Apollo, and it's, it's probably one of the, the most important pieces of special sauce that we have. If you find any former Amazon employees, they can tell you all about it. Uh, basically, it allows any developer to deploy their own code um, whenever they want to whatever fleet they want. And before I go to the next slide, I need to, to tell you about two specific concepts within Apollo. Apollo has two part, or two sort of terms that are important. One is a concept called environments. An environment is a completely contained piece of software. So the Amazon web server for Amazon.com plus its web templates is an environment. The catalog service is an environment. Um, in fact, even things like S3 is an environment. And Apollo is used to deploy these pieces of software. Then it has stages. Stages are like production or development or test or whatever. Um, and production indicates the stage where we actually are, are doing real production work on real production servers. 
So in terms of how often we're deploying, here's some interesting stats for you uh, that I pulled for the month of May out of Apollo. Uh, at Amazon, every 11.6 seconds, someone is kicking off a deployment to a production fleet at Amazon. So basically, there is continuous deployment happening with a new deployment initiating every 11.6 seconds on the average weekday. Uh, for the month of May, the single hour when we had the most deployments kicked off, uh, we kicked off 1,079 deployments in that hour to different production hosts or different production fleets. Uh, on average, there are about 10,000 hosts receiving a, simult uh, receiving a deployment simultaneously at Amazon across a whole bunch of different environments. And for the month of May, we peaked at one point at about 30,000 hosts receiving a deployment simultaneously. Uh, so lots of software change going on. But software change is only good if you can do it safely, right? Um, you could cause a lot of havoc with a system like this. And so let's look at typically how we do deployments at Amazon. They, they work probably like they do for you as well. We have a load balancer with some fleet sitting behind it. We take one host out of the, the various fleets, push the new software to it, put it back into production, grab another set of servers out, push them into, new software to them, push them into production, and so on, until we've covered the entire set of hosts. Um, this is a fine model, except it does have some problems. First of all, uh, upgrading software on a fixed fleet uh, requires complex workflows, right? We have to pull things out of load balancers, deploy new software, prime the caches, put them back in, uh, interacting with lots of different parts. Secondly, it's a very slow process, right? Like you can't just blast software out to the whole thing and expect it to work because we don't ever want to affect our customers, right? We would hate to have a customer bound to a server that didn't have a warmed up cache already. And finally, dealing with failure scenarios in this model is incredibly difficult. It requires people to exercise amazingly high judgment under incredibly stressful situations. And humans are remarkably bad at doing that, um, despite their best intentions. And so we wanted to look at a system where we could avoid some of these problems. And we came up with a different way of thinking about deployments. So again, what if you didn't have any restrictions on the number of hosts that you had? Well, one thing you could do is you could have your existing running fleet. You could copy an entire copy of your fleet, even if it's tens of thousands of hosts. It doesn't matter. There's unlimited capacity, in theory, in, in the utility computing cloud. When you finally get the software deployed to those hosts and those hosts primed up, you could simply flip the load balancer over to them and redirect all your traffic to the new hosts, right? If you find out that there's a problem with them, great. Flip back to the old version of the hosts, uh, and you're, you're up and working again. This takes an outage from being something that might span minutes or hours to something that might be a few seconds long and hardly anyone would notice. It's an amazingly powerful way of thinking about the deployment problem. And so we've been, we've been moving more and more in this direction at Amazon over the last several years. And we've had some pretty amazing results of thinking more flexibly about deployments. Uh, since 2006 at Amazon, uh, the number of software outages triggered by deployments, software deployments, has gone down by 75%. Uh, additionally, the number of minutes of outage time have gone down by 90% over that period of time. Right, that's pretty remarkable, especially given that at many companies, uh, deployments are the number one source of outages. That results in about one thousandth of a percent, or one out of 100,000 deployments actually resulting in an outage on the Amazon.com website. Now, that's still one one thousandth of one percent, way too many, right? And we're going to go try and fix the remaining one thousandth of a percent, and I think we'll do it, but it's still a pretty amazingly low number. Finally, we get instantaneous automated rollback in this model, right? We don't have to page anyone. The system can simply flip back to its old, old working copy. And we get a dramatic reduction in complexity in terms of the deployment system itself. Instead of all this elegant removing and putting back into the load balancer and replacing software in place on a server, we're simply creating a new copy. It's, it, it's just brain dead simple, which is always a good way to approach things. So I want to leave you, though, with a challenge at the end of this. Uh, I think that there are remarkable stories in the operations space, right? I've just given you two ways in which Amazon is approaching the problem. We're saving millions of dollars now by using flexible capacity on the web servers, and we're, we're actually gaining significant chunks of revenue because our website isn't down by improving the availability of the website. These are just two of, I think, the many, many great stories that are out there in terms of ops and the way it affects the business. And my challenge to you, for everyone who put their hand up uh, and said that they were more focused on ops, is to come back to Velocity next year 
and tell your stories about what Ops has done specifically for the business metrics at your company uh, so that we can steal a page out of the website performance playbook and gain respect for our profession just like they have with theirs. So thanks very much.